While I'm fresh and um, I'm rolling, are we rolling yet? We're rolling. Okay, good, all right. If you have around 20 grand to spend on a hi-fi system, let's say you've got nothing, but you've got 20 grand, you wanna buy a hi-fi system. You could go out and go the traditional route, spend a chunk of that money on speakers and another chunk on an amplifier, another chunk on a DAC and then a streamer, and then cables to connect it all together. Or you could go for the key three loudspeaker system. And I say system because it's a loudspeaker that's got the drivers here, but also amplifiers inside, DACs inside, and there is an interface to attach a streamer as well, which we'll get to. But this is an all-in-one system, custom stands as well. This is it, I mean really, the, just you see these two speakers, there's one over here, that's the entire system. And you don't need loudspeaker cables, you don't need a, a whole rack of gear, which I've got over here. None of that's required, this is just a nice minimal loudspeaker system. Not only do we not need a complete rack of gear and the rack to house things, this Key3 system is super easy to set up. You just take each speaker out of the box, put them on the stands, and then you plug them in. Mains power here, and it's routed through the stand here. And then the other thing we need to do is connect the two speakers together using Ethernet, using the proprietary Keylink protocol. So this is not for connecting to your router, so don't go and do that. This is just to join the two speakers together so they can talk to each other. And then after that, we just need to add the output of a DAC or a preamp to the XLR sockets on each one. You can go digital here as well, but that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here today. It's that simple. You just unbox them, put them on the stands, plug them in, join them together with Ethernet, and you're up and running. So the Key3 might look like a traditional two-way speaker. I mean, you've got a tweeter on the front, mid-bass driver here. That looks fairly ordinary, but we can also see there's a, a driver on the side, there's another one on this side, and there are two on the back. And each of them have their own amplifier and their own DAC feeding those amplifiers. So there's six drivers, six amps, six DACs. But why is that? Why do we have so many drivers on this speaker rather than just the two at the front? And the answer lies in solving the problem of room reflections. With a, a speaker normally, high frequencies come out of the speaker and they radiate like this. They're fairly what's called a narrow dispersion. But as the frequency gets lower, they radiate further out until we get to a point where they're radiating all around. So they're firing off to the side, off towards the front wall, so rearward here, off to this side. When they radiate, side wood and rear wood, that causes reflections on the wall. So when we're in the listening position over here, we hear not only the, the speaker's original output, but the reflections. And that can smear the mid-range, it can color the mid-range, it can make the bass sound really woolly. So what this speaker does is really smart. And at its heart, the Key3 has a 40-bit floating point DSP engine, which tells each driver what to output. It uses the side drivers and the rearward drivers to cancel out the omnidirectionally radiating sound. So if like a bass note comes out of here and then radiates all around, these side drivers and bass drivers can invert that note and use interference to cancel it out so that very little sound actually when you're playing these, very little sound goes sidewards, rearwards. So if you stand behind these key threes when they're playing, you really don't hear very much, which therefore minimizes the wall reflections, front and rear, and we get a much better result. So when we play music through the key three speaker system, it is designed so that the sound radiates in what's called a cardioid dispersion pattern. So it sort of comes out like this, but never goes rearward, out like this, and then round the front, and then sort of almost like a heart shape round here, like this. So we get very little room interaction. That is for the majority of the mid-frequency band, below the treble, above the mid-bass, and then for the lowest bass, we have to look to the back of the speaker. We have to adjust those according to 
the size of our room, how much base you want, and also the proximity to the side wall and the rear wall. And we can manually change that using some trim pots that are just on the underside here. We can tailor the low bass frequencies to our room. So we get cardioid dispersion pattern for the majority of the music. For the low bass, we have to kind of tailor it to our needs accordingly down here. So this is for wall proximity, side and front wall proximity. And then this is for the bass response profile over here. And we just put the screwdriver in these and adjust them accordingly. So the beauty of having a speaker that has a cardioid dispersion and then manually configurable low bass output is that it plays well even in smaller rooms like this one. I mean, this one's six by five meters. It's not massive and it plays ex extremely well. It's amazing that these speakers are rated from 20 hertz down below all the way up to 25 kilohertz up top. And you think, well, that's just a theoretical output and there's no way they can do that in the real world. But in this room with the cardioid and the bass configuration, I get the lowest bass I have ever heard from a stand mount speaker in any of the listening rooms that I've been using in the last eight years. This is one hell of a speaker. It performs, actually it kicks like a floor stander. So that, that really low bass is fast, it's tight, it's punchy. If you could criticize it in any way, it's a little bit dry sometimes, but then we can always fatten it up with the, the controls we've seen before on the back of the unit. Now the other benefit of cardioid dispersion and well-controlled bass is that it doesn't color the mid-range. So again, with these speakers, we get an exceptionally clear mid-range. I'm not gonna talk about accuracy because that's a pipe dream. You can't possibly know what's accurate because we don't know what the source was. And even if we were there, it depends upon the position and so many other things. But these speakers really communicate a sense of accuracy, a sense of high transparency, a sense of there being almost no window between you and the music. And this is possibly why the key guys also sell these to professional recording studios. That doesn't mean they're super clinical. It just means they err towards that accuracy feeling that many audiophiles claim that they want. So, you know, let's see if they can put their money where their mouth is. I'm willing to bet many don't because I think many audiophiles want some color. These, I don't feel that they're colored at all. And I think certainly for very dynamic electronic music, I've not heard anything like these. These are exceptional. I mean, if I'm playing something like Scuba or Mode Selector, or any of these kind of big room techno things, or even Orteca, Future Sound of London, it sounds impeccable. I cannot enthuse about these speakers enough for electronic music. They are wonderful, they're so good. Now the other great thing about having bass and, well I guess like the mid-range mid so well controlled and the cardioid dispersion in place is that these speakers communicate a tremendous sense of soundstage and player placement. So for the last five minutes, Olaf, our cameraman, has been messing around with the position of these things behind me. And they're the perfect analogy for how, when I sit over here and listen, this is what I kind of see when I'm listening to these speakers. I can see like a guitarist here and a bass player here and maybe a drummer here. A great sense of depth as well. So that sense of accuracy that audiophiles claim that they love is here in spades, not just in terms of detail and resolution, but in terms of player placement, depth perception. Again, these speakers are exceptional with communicating soundstage. So I should talk a little bit about how we get music into the key three speaker system. The XLR on the back of each speaker is an analog or a digital input, but if it's analog, the other end of our XLR cable goes into either a DAC with a volume control or a preamp. So that's how you bring vinyl into these. I guess one thing that a lot of audiophiles will want to know is, can this speaker system resolve the differences between different analog inputs, even when that analog input is digitized upon entry, process and then decoded before it goes out through the speakers? And the answer is a categorical yes. Different DACs sound different into these, different preamps. If I add a preamp to this, it sounds fatter and fuller. 
than having a DAC going direct with its own volume control. That's consistent with my previous experience with DACs and preamps. So this is one way to feed these with an analog input. In a moment, we're gonna look at how we feed them digitally. So I think the easiest, most beginner-friendly way of getting music into the Key 3 is to use this Ethernet input. You see this extra Ethernet cable here? That's connected to something over behind me called the Key Remote. It's optional, but it's not really optional. Um, with this, we can make complete adjustments to our speakers without having to use the little contour trim pots on the back of each speaker. We can execute those controls on here using the menu system. And then this obviously sends that signal to the speaker, to the DSP using Ethernet. So we can, we can configure our speakers with this unit, but that's not the main reason we use this. This is for adding digital sources. So you can see that it sends control signals, but it'll also send digital audio over this Ethernet signal. And we have three different digital inputs on the back. We've got a USB, we've got a Toslink, and a coaxial, so we can connect three different digital sources. And then we use this wheel to control the volume. And the volume control is not inside this unit, it's actually inside the speakers. So the wheel just sends a control message along the ethernet wire to the speaker to go up or down in volume. And then obviously there's around the buttons around the side here where we can select our digital sources, USB, coax, or Toslink. So I have this connected to three different devices. I have USB connected to my Inuus Zenith SE server. I have the Toslink going into my Blue Sounds node, and then I have the coaxial going into the Auralic. So I have three different devices that I can hook up here. Like that. So three different digital devices all going in, all volume control from the key remote. And here's the real mind bender of this situation. Those three digital sources, they all sound different, even going through the ethernet cable to the speaker. That's interesting, isn't it? There is one final setting available on the key remote that's not on the speaker, and that's a latency setting in case people want to hook up Blu-ray players or satellite TV boxes or TVs. And to maintain the lip sync, this key remote can disengage some of the processing inside the speaker. So there's a slight hit to sound quality, very small, but it makes sure that we don't have this great latency that causes lip sync errors. So I have that engaged when I'm watching TV and then I take it off when I'm playing music. So exact mode is for when we listen to music. That's, that's basically maximum DSP processing. Obviously there's greater latency in exact mode. And there's a mute. That's a mute. Unmute. If you want a key three system, that's the speakers themselves plus the key control in white or graphite, that's roughly 17,000 US dollars. If you want a custom color like I have here, that's an extra grand. And then the stands, an extra 1800 bucks. So roughly the whole thing, speakers, stands, key control, roughly 20 grand. Now you can go off and spend 20 grand on all sorts of hi-fi equipment, separates, buy a rack, hook it all together if you want to, but this is a really easy single purchase where you don't have to make any decisions, all the engineering is done for you, the amps are optimized for the drivers. So you're not playing this mix and match lottery of buying speakers and separates and hoping that they gel together somehow. This is a complete system that sounds utterly fantastic. You can be up and running in 15 minutes of taking delivery, you'll have music going. For me, the Key 3 system is the poster child of what I call Futurefy. I, I think this is where the high-end audio industry or space really needs to go. And these guys are way ahead of the curve with this, this system. I mean, it's just a, a single choice, plug it in, off you go, and you'd be amazed with the sound quality, especially in a smaller room like this. So if you're battling with room acoustics, yeah, you could put treatments all over the walls. I have some here, but it's not always super attractive. Neither is an entire rack of gear. Not everyone wants to live with furniture filled with components in their room. I mean, you don't want your lounge room necessary to look like a hi-fi store. 
as mine does a little bit here. So this is just an entire speaker system plus the key control, extremely minimal. And I really think you would struggle to compile a system based upon passive speakers, outboard amplifier that would match the performance for this in a room and be able to kind of tweak it to the room. I think if you've got 20 grand to spend, this is where you should start. This is the system against which all other 20 grand systems should be judged. Exceptional. <laughs> I always do that, I always repeat that word. <laughs>